Welcome to today's first lecture of this mini course on extracting programs for proofs. First, I think to the online participants, um, I cannot hear you, but I can read the chat. So if you have any questions whatsoever, interruptions, feel free to use the chat. If you want to use your voice, then also first use the chat. Then I see that you might want to issue some, some voice comment. Then I can change the audio setup and then I can hear you. But right now I cannot hear you. I can just read you. Uh, welcome also to all the people in presence. May I have a quick show of hands? Who is a local Verona person? You too, Yusuf, who's a local Verona person? Yeah, who is local? Yes, okay. And the remaining are from Padova? Yeah, awesome, you're welcome. Good, uh, today's first lecture is about constructive mathematics. Um, I will like to, uh, I will introduce that using a couple of examples. Um, tomorrow we will learn about the actual core topic of this course, namely extracting programs from proof. And then on the third lecture on Thursday, we will um, turn to classical mathematics again. So we are taking a slight detour, but it will all make a coherent story in the end. Uh, very important. Um, I'm not a person um, who is like, um, like extremely well established so that you need lots of respect in interacting with me. Yeah? I'm just a postdoc, I'm Ingo. I'm not Mr. Blechschmidt, I'm just Ingo, yeah? And you can just interrupt me with all questions, comments, ideas, whenever you want to. You don't need to save them to the end of the lecture or whatever, just interrupt me mid sentence. Yeah? Let's start with a primer on constructive mathematics. Good. Um, here is an example. Let me prove the following. There are irrational numbers, x and y, such that x to the y is rational. There are irrational numbers x and y such that x to the y is rational. Recall a real number is rational if it has a decimal expansion which stops after some finite amount of digits or which repeats, um, uh, which, which infinitely repeats a certain block of, of numbers. Like one over three is rational because it's 0 0.3333 and so on. And if a number is not rational, then it's called irrational. For instance, the square root of two is irrational. Yeah, and you might wonder whether it can happen that two irrational numbers when raised to their power um, uh, results in, result in an, an irrational number. And the answer is yes, indeed, that's possible. And here's a quick proof of this fact. Um, let's study this number, square root of two to the square root of two this number might be rational. It might also not be rational. In the first case, um, we are done by setting x to be square root of two and y to be square root of two, right? Because in the first case, well, we have assumed that square root of two to the square root of two is a rational number. And in the second case, we are also done, however, using a more complicated uh, definition, we now use for x, square root of two to the square root of two, which in that second case is an irrational number. And we set y to be square root of two again. And then you can check that x to the y is square root of two to the square root of two times the square root of two. So to the two, so two, so it's rational. Hello, you're welcome.
So in each case, we are done. And this concludes the proof. So by that, we know that in the platonic heaven of all numbers, they exist irrational numbers such that x to the y is rational. However, um, in case you are um, fascinated by that, um, by that result, and now go on to tell your roommate about the result, then that roommate might uh, issue the following question to you, namely, aha, uh -huh, interesting, can you tell me an example for a pair of irrational numbers such that their power is rational? And then you notice that if all you know is this proof, then you cannot. This proof didn't really give you an example for two such numbers. It told you that in the first case, that would make a fine example. And in the second case, that would make a fine example. But the proof doesn't tell you which of those cases actually um, occurs. And that is um, why we call this proof a non-constructive proof. It doesn't actually tell you um, an example. It just promises that there is an example somewhere in the platonic heaven. It cannot be that there is no example, but it doesn't actually give you an example. In case you um, happen to have studied number theory, then you might know that using quite a delicate argument, one can in fact show that the second case holds true. And hence that is uh, an example we are looking for. But that requires a separate argument using integral computations, several pages long. Um, it's definitely not contained in those three lines. Um, can we do better? Is there also a constructive proof? Um, and in this case, it turns out, yes, there is. Namely, we set the following. For x, we pick square root of two, which is well known to be an irrational number. And for y, we pick the logarithm with respect to square root of two of three. Because then x to the y is three, which is a rational number. Of course, this number is not um, as well known to be irrational as the square root of two. However, a proof that this number is irrational is in fact easier than the proof that the square root of two is irrational. So that is a straightforward and informative proof. We call this proof constructive. It doesn't only promise that the result is true, it also supplies us with a witness to the result, an explicit example. Okay, and well, constructive mathematics is a flavor of mathematics um, where we allow these kinds of proofs, the constructive ones, but where we refrain from using non-constructive proofs. I give you a, a, a bit more, a little bit more of a definition of what constructive mathematics is in a second. Um, let me first give you a further example. <clears throat> um, recall that there are infinitely many prime numbers. One way to write that fact down and to prove it is as follows. Um, given any natural number n, there is a prime p larger than n. And here's a proof, usually attributed to Euclid. Um, any prime factor of n factorial plus one will do. So n factorial is some, some large number, one times two times three times and so on times n. Now add one to that number. Then um, you obtain a new natural number. Like every natural number greater than one, it can be decomposed into prime factors. 
and all those prime factors will be prime numbers larger than n because for sure this number is not divisible by any number smaller than or equal to n because by construction there will be a residue of one when trying to carry out the division. So this is again a constructive proof. Because it not only um, certifies the truth of the statement, it also supplies a witness. More precisely, this proof here is not only an English text, but this proof can also be understood as a recipe, as an algorithm for actually computing a prime number P, which is larger than a given number N. So um, hidden in this proof is in fact an algorithm for computing larger and larger prime numbers. And um, the uh, subject of today's lecture will be to understand in a precise manner how proofs like this actually give rise to programs, how we can extract Turing machines or machines of some other computational model from proofs, more precisely from constructive proofs. Let me tell you one more example uh, for which I will remove the first one so for space reasons. Alessandro is uh, uh, online, thank you very much, is noticing that um, they cannot see uh, the, the right, like this part of the blackboard. I will try to be more careful uh, next. Thank you very much, Alessandro. Okay, one more example. Um, every function alpha from n to n is good in the sense, in the very specific sense, but um, for some um, i j in n, i less than j in n, alpha of i is smaller than or equal to alpha of j. Every function is good in the sense that some earlier function value is less than or equal to some later function value earlier and later um, as seen from the x-axis. Here's a proof. Note that there's a minimal value Uh, among the infinitely many values of the function alpha, at least one of them is the minimal value. All the others are larger than or equal to that one. So we can conclude by setting j to be i plus one. Because alpha of j will be some other value. At most it will be of the same value as alpha of i, more likely it will be strictly larger. So that concludes the proof. Is that a constructive or, or an unconstructive proof? Does it contain a recipe for finding i and j? A little bit hard to tell in this example, I guess. I would say the following. The part 
starting after this full stop, the part to the right here, that is constructive. It explicitly tells us how to set J. However, the first part is not constructive because given an infinite function, there is no recipe, no algorithm for computing the minimal value of it. We, uh, if we were interested in the minimal value, we could, for instance, compute the first couple function values, let's say the first 1 million, and then discover a minimum among the first 1 million elements. Okay, and that has some chances of being the true minimum value among all the infinitely many function values. But it might also just not be the minimum. It might be that even smaller numbers appear in the as of yet unexplored range of alpha. So in total, this is again an unconstructed proof. Amazingly, however, what we will find out in the third lecture is that um, we can still extract a program from this proof. So this, um, it, it will turn out that this proof, which as written down is totally unconstructive, um, that, that this proof contains some hidden constructive core and using a certain technique, we will be able to unearth this constructive core and then apply the standard tool of program extraction, which we will learn about tomorrow, to the transform constructive proof. Um, I think that's, that's quite marvelous because this proof doesn't give you any indication how to find i and j. This proof seems hopelessly unconstructive, um, but still it can be constructivized mechanically without creative input. Any questions, comments, remarks about these three examples or anything else? Yes. Uh -huh, indeed. So that is a very short classical proof. There's also a not much longer constructive proof of the same fact. Um, and uh, yeah, let's put that as an exercise. Um, uh, find a constructive proof of the same statement. Um, if you want to, you can also not do the exercise, but wait for day three, where we will learn a technique for automatically converting this classical proof into constructive proof. But it's fun to do the exercise uh, nevertheless. Okay, uh, let me try some kind of a definition of what constructive mathematics is. Um, no definition will be uh, will actually be a good definition, yeah, because constructive mathematics is in the end um, the, the term for the kind of mathematics which constructive mathematicians are pursuing, but of course that's a circular definition. Um, it's just a, by a vast subject with lots of variants, but let me try nevertheless. Hello, you're welcome. Okay, constructive mathematics. It's a certain flavor of mathematics. Which is centered around constructive, around informative constructions. To be more precise, it's the same as classical mathematics, except that we don't use certain principles. Namely, we don't use LEM 
we don't use D and E, and we don't use AC. I will explain all those in a second. And classical mathematics is simply the term for the flavor of mathematics ordinary generic mathematicians are pursuing. It might be an interesting historical question as to like when the standard mathematics we nowadays use um, actually emerged. But let me say, if you meet some random mathematician, then they will with high probability be a classical mathematician. They will freely use these three principles. And constructive mathematics is mathematics without those three principles. Um, let me, by the way, just remark that um, I was quite uh, intrigued when I first learned about constructive mathematics because I didn't know that there's more than one flavor of mathematics. I thought like mathematics is just like one building, yeah, and of course it has like several rooms in it. There's number theories, there's partial differential equations, and so on and so forth. But it's just one building. Turns out there are in fact several flavors of mathematics. Uh, and both classical and constructive mathematics can be subdivided into sub flavors. And then there are even more flavors than those two. Yeah? So the world is uh, richer than it looks on first sight. Um, you could also say it's mathematics, but built on um, intuitionistic logic. Intuitionistic logic instead of classical logic. So classical logic is the logic underpinning classical mathematics. It includes LEM and DNE, whatever that is. I will explain in a second. And classical set theory as, an, um, as the standard foundation layered upon classical logic also includes AC, the axiom of choice. And yeah, constructive mathematics is now built on intuitionistic logic. Um, intuitionistic, that's just a, let's say, weird term. Um, it doesn't mean mathematics solely grounded in intuition or something like that. Just a term, formal term, intuitionistic logic. Intuitionistic logic is the same as classic logic, except that, again, we don't use those principles. Um, what is LEM and what is DNE and what is AC? LEM is the statement that for any proposition phi, phi or not phi. Phi or not phi. So any proposition is true or, well, it's not true, it's false. That's the statement. That is the principle, of, um, the law of excluded middle. And if, you, and if you're a classical mathematician, if you've received classical training, then it's very weird to cast doubts on this principle because it's just uh, uh, an evident truth. Any statement is true or not. Uh, recall that this is referring to mathematical statements, not political statements. So if I would now make the claim that Donald Trump was a good president, you might argue in favor or against that. And perhaps he was neither, perhaps it's hard to tell, okay? But regarding mathematical propositions, our classical training suggests that this is a self-evident truth. So it's a little bit weird that we do without it, but um, I will um, try to motivate um, why it does make sense to do without it. And it will turn out that there are in fact lots and lots of applications of doing without that principle. Second is D and E uh, to the online viewers. Um, you cannot read that, but after LEM, we have DNE. That's the law of double negation elimination. And it states that not not phi implies phi. Again, that's from a classic point of view, it's a triviality. In fact, you, you, you probably haven't 
even seen that written down because a classical mathematician is just so used to canceling double negations as soon as they arise. But in constructive mathematics, it turns out, and we will, dis, uh, we will spend quite a bit of time on understanding that in more detail, that not not phi is something entirely else than phi. We have the direction from right to left. So any proposition phi, phi implies its double negation. So this direction we do have, but the direction from the double negation to phi is something which in generally for most propositions phi, we do not have available in constructive mathematics. Okay, and then the final one, AC, that's the axiom of choice. I don't want to write it down right now, but we will discuss it tomorrow in more detail. Let me just mention two fun for two statement, two things about AC. Firstly, it's not an axiom of logic, but of a set theory layered upon logic. Alternatively, you can also understand that as an axiom or principle of type theory, if you want to found your mathematics on a version of type theory. And let me also mention that the axiom of choice implies the law of excludal middle. Um, so if we want to do without LEM, uh, we are forced to also do without AC. And finally, let me remark that LEM and DNE are in fact equivalent principles. They look a little bit different, but uh, you can show that will be an exercise that those principles are in fact equivalent. If for any proposition phi, we have phi or not phi, then also this and the other way around. Okay, that is some, um, some approximation to uh, a definition of what constructive mathematics is. And take care. This will be stressed in the third lecture. Take care. This definition is misleading because um, from this definition, you obtain the impression that constructive mathematics is somehow less than classical mathematics. Right, because in constructive mathematics, we may not use those principles, whereas in classical mathematics, we may. So it looks from that definition, like that constructive mathematics would be a kind of subset of classical math mathematics. But in fact, we will see that in the third lecture, in a certain different sense, constructive mathematics turns out to be an expansion of classical mathematics, not a restriction of it. So this definition is misleading. It's technically correct in so far as this is precise at all, but it is misleading. Uh, constructive mathematics is an expansion of classical mathematics, not a restriction. Next, I would like to um, tackle a common misconception about constructive mathematics, and then give you a list of reasons why you might be interested in constructive mathematics. Any questions, comments, ideas, wishes? Okay. So there's a certain rumor about constructive mathematics. This rumor is false, but still it widely circulates. That rumor states that in constructive mathematics, the word contradiction is forbidden. 
that's not true. Let me explain. Uh, <clears throat> we need to distinguish the following two figures of proof. The first one is the following. Um, we want to show some statement phi. And the proof goes as follows. Assume for the sake of a contradiction that not phi, then blah, 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 blah. That's a contradiction, hence phi. So that is typically called a proof by contradiction. And um, those kinds of proofs are not in general acceptable in constructive mathematics. This is an unconstructive proof. And this is where that rumor originates that the word contradiction is forbidden in constructive mathematics, but stay tuned for the second figure of proof in a second. That's a proper proof by contradiction. We want to prove some statement. And instead of doing that directly, we instead assume for the sake of a contradiction that its negation holds. And then from that negation, using computations, ideas, results, whatever, obtain a contradiction and thereby conclude that in the end, phi needs to be true. Okay, that is a proof by contradiction. And don't confuse that with the following um, setting. Sometimes we want to prove that some other statement psi is not true. We want to prove not psi. And the way we do that is as follows. Proof, um, assume psi, then blah, blah, blah. That's a contradiction. Um, yeah, hence not psi. So this figure of proof also contains the word contradiction, but this figure of proof is in fact totally acceptable in constructive mathematics. It's not a proper proof by contradiction. Um, it's just a proof of a negated statement. And it's okay to uh, prove a negated statement like that um, because of the following. Um, how is negation defined in logic? Well, that depends on the kind of logic you are studying. And uh, one of the world experts in a certain flavor of negation is sitting in that room. But the standard definition of negation um, in intuitionistic logic and also in classical logic is the following. So not psi by definition is the same as the claim that psi would imply a contradiction. That is the definition of a statement not being true, that it would imply a contradiction. So if we want to prove not psi, we can follow the definition, assume psi and obtain from that a contradiction. So that's totally fine. Um, to, to be more concrete, um, for instance, um, the standard proof of uh, the irrationality of square root of two is constructively perfectly acceptable. 
proposition square root of two is not rational. Proof. Assume that square root of two is rational. So square root of two is A over B for some blah, 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 blah. And then you paste one of the standard proofs into it. You obtain a contradiction and you are done. That is a valid proof in constructive mathematics of the uh, statement that the square root of two is not rational. Indeed, yeah. Um, so even from the point of classic logic, these two are distinct figures of proof. However, a classical mathematician will not really care about that, yeah? Both are fine in classical mathematics. In constructive mathematics, this figure of proof is fine. And that figure of proof is not guaranteed to be fine. It depends on the situation, it depends on phi, but it's not generally acceptable. Do you know what, from a, from a constructive point of view, what this proof actually only proves? This proof, we can still try to recover uh, constructive content from that proof, but it will not be a proof of pi. It will be a proof of some related statement. Exactly. So this here, Constructively, constructively, this proof only shows not not phi. It shows that the assumption of not phi entails a contradiction. So not not phi. And if you now had the law of double negation available, you could go from not not phi to phi, which is implicitly done from here to there by a classical mathematician. Also, if you had the law of Slutal middle available, which is, as I already uh, spoiled, equivalent to the law of double negation emission, then you could also go from here to there because the law of exclude middle will tell you that phi holds or that not phi holds. Now the proof tells you that not phi does not hold, Hence, there's just one option, namely that phi holds. Okay, so you need from, from here to there, something is happening. You need the law of slow middle or the law of double negation elimination to actually conclude phi from what the proof actually showed, namely not not phi. Okay. Let me try to motivate why um, dropping the law of slew middle and dropping uh, the law of double negation elimination and dropping the axiom of choice um, uh, can make sense. Uh, I will motivate that uh, in two ways. Firstly, um, I'll give an um, explanation based on meaning. And then I will give a couple of explanations based on applications. The, the explanation given on meaning is a little bit philosophical. You might also disagree with it or don't like it, but then there are like actual applications. Um, in constructive mathematics, we use the same classic symbols, the same logical symbols as in classical mathematics. So for instance, the implication symbol, the negation symbol, the or symbol, the and symbol, and so on. We use the same logical symbols. However, we interpret them
differently. And I will now write down a table between the uh, listing the meaning of the logical connectives in classical mathematics and in constructive mathematics. And from that different meaning, you uh, can then gather that it totally makes sense meaning-wise to uh, not use the laws of excluded middle, not use them. So oh, let's make a table of statements, their classical meaning and their constructive meaning. So on an arbitrary phi, if you utter phi in a classic context, then what we mean is that phi is true. In the platonic heaven, where classical mathematics unfolds, phi happens to be true. The constructive meaning is more like the following. We have a witness for phi. You might wonder what the, what's, what's a witness, yeah. Um, what a witness will get a little bit clearer in a second when the table grows. And we will formalize this idea tomorrow um, because it will turn out that instead of witness, we can also say um, um, computer program witnessing phi and then everything will have a very precise definition. Uh, for instance, uh, let's say um, alpha and beta the conjunction of two statements. Classically, that means, well, alpha and beta are both true. Constructively, that means we have a witness for alpha and we have a witness for beta. alpha or beta, classically it states um, alpha is true, um, alpha or beta is true. Now, constructively we have the following intended meaning. We have a witness for alpha or we have a witness for beta. We have a witness for alpha or we have a witness for beta. And there's a crucial difference because if you're only interested in classical truth and you want to show that alpha or beta holds, then you can also just show that it cannot be the case that both are false. However, just from knowing that it cannot be the case that both are false, you neither have a witness for alpha nor a witness for beta. So that's a crucial difference in, uh, yeah, in the semantics of disjunction. Classically, for a disjunction to hold, it's enough that it cannot be that both disjuncts are false constructively. We need to be more informative. Uh, if you want to constructively verify alpha or beta, we actually need to supply a witness or we need to supply a witness for beta for one of those, but it's not okay to sh merely show the impossibility of the absence of those witnesses. Um, alpha implies beta states um, 
um, hypothetically, if alpha is true, then so is beta. Constructively, that means something else, namely, um, we have a uniform procedure, uniform procedure for turning witnesses for alpha into witnesses for beta. We have a uniform procedure for turning witnesses for alpha into witnesses for beta. Yeah. What do I mean by uniform? Great question. Um, um, so in that informal setting, I cannot really tell you, yeah? It's just some vague intuitive idea. You might also ask, what do you mean proceed by procedure? And again, in this informal setting, I cannot tell you, but uh, tomorrow uh, when we make this formal, uh, then I will be able to answer you and let me also answer right now. And then tomorrow this will make more sense. Uh, by uniform procedure, I mean a single algorithm. One algorithm which accepts any witness for alpha as input and produces then as output some witness for beta. Um, let's um, do yeah, a couple more. Um, not alpha means alpha is false. Constructively, it means there is no witness for alpha. And for the sake of, um, uh, of completeness, let me also write down the two clauses for uh, quantification. So this and that. I'm using a colon here feel free to use an element sign. There's no particular deeper meaning uh, to my usage of the colon. It's just that I like type theory and in type theory, we use the colon, in set theory, we use the element sign, but it's just um, at the level of formality where we are, where this blackboard is set in currently, it's just a matter of, of, of taste. Okay, this states um, for all X, phi x is true. The other one states that phi of x is true for at least one x. Okay, and what is the constructive wit uh, meaning of the first clause of the first uh, of the universal quantification? We have a uniform procedure um, which um, produces um, witnesses for phi of x um, and it does so for any x. So a witness for a universal statement like that is some kind of procedure, a machine, um, which inputs some arbitrary lowercase x and then outputs a witness for that phi of x, for that specific value of x. And the last one, existential quantification, um, that would be we have an actual lowercase x together with a witness 
for uh, uh, four or five x. We have an x together with a witness for phi of x. We have an x together with a witness for phi of x. And as with this junction, there's a crucial difference because in classic, classical mathematics, if we want to verify that there is some x with the property phi of x, then we can just as well show that um, it's not the case that there's no such x. We it uh, suffices to show that for all x, um, that it cannot be the case that for all x, not phi of x. But constructively, we need to be more informative and actually exhibit a lowercase x. So in some sense, the only difference between classical and constructive mathematics is in the interpretation of the disjunction and the existential uh, quantification, because these require more work in constructive mathematics in order to verify them. This table, this interpretation is called the BHK interpretation after Brauer, Heiting, and Kolmogorov. We will formalize it tomorrow. Um, and just to give you an idea how this table can be used, let me write down two or three examples real quick. You will see more of those um, uh, in the exercises. Um, for instance, this one. If not alpha and beta, then not alpha or not beta. That's one of the De Morgan rules in classical logic. And judging from the BHK interpretation, would you feel like that would have also a constructive proof? Or would you feel like that would be uh, a, a thing exclusive to classical mathematics? The um, mean, yeah. Constructive. Let's check. The meaning of the left-hand side is, according to this clause, that there is no witness for alpha and beta. The meaning of the right-hand side is that we have a witness for not alpha, or we have a witness for not beta. OK. How should we, just from that negative piece of information that there is no witness for alpha and beta, how should we from that piece of information um, get hold of a witness either for the first thing or for the second? We cannot in general. So this is an unconstructive principle. From the mere promise that there is no witness for alpha and beta. We do not yet know whether we, uh, and more importantly, we, we not only not know, but also we, we don't have a witness for not alpha. Um, and also we don't have a witness for not beta. So we cannot constructively have hope to verify the disjunction in general. For specific values of alpha and beta, um, this might be constructively fine. For instance, if Alpha happens to be the statement that two equals four, which is false, then of course we can verify not alpha. We can verify in constructive mathematics that two is not the same as four. And hence we can also verify the implication, totally disregarding the assumption, totally disregarding beta. So there are cases where we can show that constructively. There are also more interesting, interesting cases than this weird example from just before. 
where we can show that in configurable mathematics. But in general, we cannot. One more. You already know this to be unconstructive, but let me write it down again for fun. Not not phi implies phi. This is the law of double negation elimination. It's not available in constructive mathematics. And what would it mean with this BHK interpretation in mind? The law of double negation elimination would mean that there's a uniform procedure which, um, which is able to produce witnesses for phi given as input witnesses for not not phi. Okay, but how does, what does a witness for not not phi look like? Well, um, a witness for negation is simply the promise that there is no witness for the thing itself. So a witness for not not phi is just the promise that there is no witness for not phi. Okay, but just if somebody pr uh, promises you that there is no witness for not phi, does not mean that now you got hold of a witness for phi. Yeah? From uh, getting to positive information from negative one is uh, very hard in constructive mathematics. It sometimes happens, but only in exceptional circumstances. Um, one more, a final one. Um, Yeah, perhaps this one, phi implies not not phi. So this is something which we do have available in constructive mathematics. And the meaning is there's a uniform procedure which transforms witnesses for phi into promises that there cannot be a witness for not phi. Sure, yeah, if we are given a witness for phi, that's a certain way to be sure that phi is true. Well, then there cannot be a witness for its negation, else everything would be uh, inconsistent. Yeah. Okay. Um, let me do a real world example. Let's picture the following situation. Um, it's morning. You want to leave your apartment, um, but you don't find the keys to your apartment, which you would like to use in order to lock your apartment. However, you do know that the keys need to be somewhere in the apartment because you used them last night in order to enter your apartment. In this situation, um, constructively, we can um, justify the following. It's not that the case that there is an X such that the key is at position X. It cannot be the case that the key vanished. No? But constructively, we cannot claim the strong statement that there actually is a position X where the key is at, because according to the constructive meaning of the existential quantifier, to claim such a statement means that to also have, have this X. But if right now we don't know where our apartment keys are, then we don't know the, where the position and what the position of the keys is. Huh? So in that situation, we can constructively um, defend 
this claim, but we cannot constructively defend this claim. To a classical mathematician, there's of course no difference between those two statements, which already shows you an important principle of constructive mathematics um, or a fact about constructive mathematics, namely that we can use constructive mathematics in order to make finer distinctions. Constructive classical mathematics is blind to the difference between double negation and the statement itself. Whereas in constructive mathematics, these two are hugely different. Um, let me just orally tell you a second real world example. A couple of years ago, the, um, a video surfaced of Kate Moss, the supermodel. And on that video, from that video, it was clear that Kate Moss was taking drugs, um, some kind of illegal substances. And it was clear that it would be drugs of some type A or that it would be drugs of some type B from the picture of it. However, from the video, it was not clear that she actually took drugs of type A. And it also was not clear that she took drugs of type B. Hence, Kate Moss was not persecuted uh, by, by the British law enforcement agencies. Perhaps that might have also different reasons, but in that sense, uh, in that case, uh, the British law enforcement system is a constructive system. Yeah? Just is that they had evidence um, that it needs to be one of those two types, but uh, those are distinct types of drugs and they are prosecuted differently and they not had clear evidence that she took that kind of drug and also not that kind of drug. Okay, let me um, give you a long list of applications of constructive mathematics. Question from the internet. Um, excellent question. The question is how can we, in the BHK interpretation, how can we, um, what is meant by uniform procedure in the case of that universal quantifier um, where um, in the case that the domain we are quantifying over the capital X happens to be an infinite domain like the um, uh, set of all natural numbers. Uh, what we mean, and we will see that uh, in more detail tomorrow, is um, it should be a single algorithm which um, works for an arbitrary x. So a single algorithm which reads an arbitrary x as input and then does some computation and then outputs a witness for phi of x. A non-uniform procedure might something like uh, might something be like we have a couple of algorithms. And the first algorithms works for a couple of axes, and the second algorithm works for some other kinds of axes, and so on. But that's not what we mean. Um, a witness for a universal statement in constructive mathematics is a single procedure which um, works for arbitrary axes as input. Okay, what are applications of constructive mathematics or um, uh, to put it more prosaically, following a quote of Georg Kreisel, what more do we know if we have proved a theorem by restricted means, for instance, by the means of constructive mathematics where we don't use LAM, D, and E, and AC, by restricted means than if we merely know the theorem is true. So 
what more do we know if we have proved a theory by restricted means than if we merely know by some means, for instance, by a classical proof that, or also by God telling us or a friend telling us that the theorem is true? I think that's a great question. And um, um, it's not only a question, it's also like um, the overarching vision for great parts of constructed mathematics. There is no single answer to that. Instead, every day, somebody contributes a further piece of an answer to that question. But let me write down a couple of like general classes of answers to that question. Um, and let me state with, start with, um, let's say soft, re, uh, soft, soft answers. Um, so one might be, um, it's more fun, very, very soft, not really a scientific application, but still perhaps an important thing considering that we are humans. Um, I really, really liked it when, uh, when I learned constructive mathematics and when I then went back to my undergraduate notes and uh, started to read them with, with fresh eyes, now uh, um, thinking about their constructive content. And it turned out that some theorems were still acceptable in, from the stronger um, point of view of constructive mathematics as they were stated. Others um, were no longer acceptable, yet others needed to be reformulated slightly in order to be acceptable. For, for me personally, that was fun, okay? Um, also, perhaps you're interested in philosophy of mathematics uh, or philosophy of logic, stuff like that, then the difference between those is also um, interesting. Um, it's also good for the mental hygiene. Okay? In the sense that um, if, um, if you learn what constructive mathematics is, um, and if you then um, perhaps relearn your favorite subject of mathematics or computer science from a constructive point of view, uh, then after finishing that learning process, you have a higher mental hygiene in the sense that it's no longer the case that like all the results just like float around. Instead, you know, aha, this result, this was constructive, except for that specific point in the proof where it used LEM. Or, you know, aha, this, this result, that's, that was totally unconstructive. It used LEM all over the place. Stuff like that, mental hygiene. Um, and perhaps a final soft, soft answer to Kreisel's question. Um, we have a better appreciation for classical mathematics or for classical logic. Yeah, only once we are sensitive to issues of constructivity, only then we can really appreciate the power of classical logic where for any phi we have phi or not phi. Uh, a widely preposterous claim from a constructive point of view taken for granted in classical logic. Yeah? To, to appreciate that, we need to have played around with constructive mathematics before. Okay, but there are also, um, that these were like soft reasons. Yeah? You can disregard all of them if you want to. Uh, let me slowly progress to less soft reasons. One is the following. Um, Constructive um, mathematics is a kind of beauty assistance. Recall, we not only want to do mathematics, we want to do beautiful mathematics, where our proofs are beautiful, very nice, very tidy, very clean. It turns out that um, many proofs in classical mathematics um, are not acceptable in constructive mathematics when taken at face, face value. Um, instead, we need to reformulate them. We need to tidy them up. Many proofs in classical mathematics um, needlessly employ appeals to the law of student middle. Um, my favorite example from my undergraduate years was in linear algebra. Don't know whether you have taken that subject. 
There, the lecturer wanted to prove that the kernel of a linear map is a subvector space, uh, which has a direct proof. However, they proceeded as follows. They said, well, the first case, the kernel contains just the zero vector. In that case, the kernel is a subvector space. In the second case, where the kernel contains more than that, just the zero vector, then, and then they did the actual verification using the subvector space axioms and concluded. Okay, you can simplify the proof by just getting rid of the first case because the proof supplied in the second case works just as well for the general case. Yeah? But from a classical point of view, you also would agree from a classical point of view, but a, cl a classical logic does not force you to tidy up the proof. Right? It allows you to have this uh, totally needless case distinction, whereas constructive mathematics forces you to, to be more clean. Of course, you could argue that it's better to be forced, yeah? uh, but you all know that sometimes it's good to have some pressure on you. Yeah? It's, it's good that we have some kind of axioms in order so that we learn more and so on. Yeah? We, uh, but perhaps you also noticed that, that you took some course without participating in the final axiom because you had too much other things to do. And I'm sure you will agree that you will remember less from that course, yeah? even though axioms are, are bad in some sense, yeah? but still they have some good usage to it. And here it's the same. Constructive mathematics forces you to write up your mathematics in a more beautiful way. And there's an exercise, um, which is, I think, quite a nice illustration of that, where the classical proof immediately comes to your mind, it is quite ugly. And then there's a constructive proof, which is much shorter, but uh, which somehow classical mathematics, uh, classical mathematical training um, prohibits you from discovering. You, you perhaps, um, you will make a different, ex different experience. Perhaps you will write down the constructive proof immediately, but, uh, but for me, it wasn't that the case. The classical uh, um, non-beautiful proof was just so, so, so much at the front of my mind that I was not able to discover the much more beautiful constructive proof. Okay, but let's get rid of all those soft or softish reasons. Program extraction. Okay, from any constructive proof, we can mechanically extract a program which then witnesses that uh, uh, the result. For instance, from a constructive proof that beyond every number n, there is a prime number, we can mechanically, using the tools of tomorrow's lecture, we can mechanically extract a computer program, a Turing machine, a Python program, which computes, which reads an arbitrary natural number as input and produces a prime number larger than it. Or from a constructive proof that some equation has a solution, we can mechanically extract a program which actually computes that solution to the equation, stuff like that. Um, to give a computer science example, from a constructive proof that every list can be sorted, can be put into ascending order, we can mechanically extract an actual sorting algorithm for carrying out the, the sorting task. And just as the, in computer science, there are um, lots of sorting algorithms, insert sort, merge sort, quick sort, and so on, it turns out that there are lots of proofs of the mathematical fact that any list can be sorted. Yeah. So pro proofs are really blueprints for programs. That is true if we restrict to constructive proofs. And if we, um, if we are thinking about general classical proofs, then, then it's still true, but only in a relaxed sense, which you will learn about on, uh, in the third lecture. But it's, uh, the, the correspondence is not as, as tight. Yeah. OK, that is really a, a big advantage of having a constructive proof available. We can mechanically extract a progress in program witnessing the claim. Um, automatic parameter dependence. Um, 
perhaps you're starting an equation containing a lowercase x. And uh, you are wondering whether this equation has a solution, whether there is a lowercase x such that the equation holds true. OK, that's the situation. But now it might be that somewhere in that equation, an additional parameter occurs, some, um, some theta. And you, uh, you are now wondering, not only does that equation, let's say, for instance, that, does that equation have a solution in X? But you're um, also wondering how the solutions depend on the value of the parameter theta. For instance, it might be that uh, the solution X depends on theta in a continuous manner or in a differential manner or in some other manner, not continuous, not differentiable, or even in a stronger manner. For instance, in this case, well, one solution is square root of theta. And you know that the square root function is continuous, but it's not differentiable at zero. OK, so in this case, using no logic whatsoever, just undergraduate calculus, you have established that uh, the solution x depends on theta in a continuous fashion, but not in a differentiable fashion. Okay, that might, might be interesting or important to know if you are pursuing um, analysis. Um, now, there's this word automatic here. Um, because we have the following meta theorem. Um, if there's a constructive proof that an equation con uh, has a solution, then the solution will automatically depend on, the, on any appearing parameters in a continuous fashion. So just from a constructive existence proof of the solvability of an equation, you can deduce that the equations which all exist, that the solutions which all exist, not only exist, but also that they depend on the parameter in a continuous fashion. And that is, that is uh, quite astounding. Um, if I recall my lectures on differential equations, ordinary differential, differential equations, the lecturer often stated some existence result whose proof spent, let's say, a couple of blackboards. And then they stated that the solution depends continuously on the parameter. And that required a second proof, shorter than the first one, perhaps, but still a second proof. Turns out, if the first proof is constructive, the lecturer wouldn't have needed to explicitly spell out the second proof because it's automatic. Axiomatic freedom um, and toposes. Um, there's a thing called topos. Um, a topos is a certain kind of category with certain properties. The informal way to think about a topos is as a mathematical universe in which we can do mathematics. Um, most mathematicians have never heard of that word topos. Most mathematicians are not topos theorists. They are also secretly are working internally to a topos, um, namely to the so-called standard topos. Most mathematicians work in the standard topos. But then it turns out that in addition to the standard topos, there's a host of alternative toposes. And each alternative topos validates um, um, its own um, flavor of logic. And the greatest common denominator of all toposes is constructive mathematics. So if we want a result to be true in all toposes, then we are forced not by philosophical concerns, but by facts, we are forced to write up our proof in a constructive fashion so that it can be interpreted in any topos whatsoever. Why might this be interesting? Well, firstly, because toposes in itself have applications to several parts of mathematics, but um, let me be a little bit more specific because um, um, you can explore a greater range of possible axioms. For instance, there's a topos in which approximately the following holds true. Every function from the whatsoever, from the reals to the reals is continuous. Every function from the reals to the reals is continuous. 
Okay, so somehow in this topos, no discontinuous functions exist, which is nice if you're only interested in, const in continuous functions. There's another topos in which the following statement holds true, and we will, um, without using the T word, but still we will learn about that topos tomorrow. There's a topos in which every function from the naturals to the naturals is computable by a Turing machine. So that's a great context for computer scientists because in computer science, we are not really interested in uncomputable functions. We are only interested in computable functions. So it makes sense to travel to a topos in which we never need to deal with uncomputable functions, in which all functions are computable. However, the axiom that every function from n to n is computable contradicts the law of through the middle. And also the axiom that the, every function from the reals to the reals is continuous, contradicts the law of through the middle. And many more axioms are nice, perfectly fine axioms on their own, but they contradict the law of through the middle. Um, hence, if you want to explore those other axioms, those anti-classical axioms, we need to get rid of the law of through the middle, else we, are just, we just have an inconsistent theory. And a final one, if we have managed to prove a theorem in a constructive fashion, then we learn more than just the truth of the theorem. Instead, we also learn, depending on the situation, quite a bit of auxiliary information. For instance, we might uh, learn certain bounds, like um, how large is the solution, depending on theta, some a priori bound. Or um, if we, um, prove that um, some fun function is actually total, that for every x, there is, there is a value f of x, but the function does not have, um, what's it called, um, uh, points of undefinability. Yeah? Um, then we, um, uh, using some techniques, we can uh, we, we learn the growth rate of that function. Like, is it more, is it going grow, is it growing, um, uh, faster than the Ackermann function, or is it growing less fast, for instance? Yeah. Stuff, stuff, stuff like that. Additional information, which kind of information depends on the statement question, depend, depends on the subject, but we always learn some kind of additional information from a constructive proof. Okay, and for the purposes of this course, uh, the thing with the program extraction is the most important one. Any questions, comments, additions, thoughts for that? Hmm? Uh -huh. Exactly. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. In, yeah. Yes. Great, great example. Uh, thank you, Yusuf. Um, uh, let, let, let me just say a part of it loud again for the microphone. Yeah. Um, that second example, I think, from the beginning, every function from end to end is good. Yeah. Um, um, if if you do a constructive proof and then ex do this machinery, yeah, then you not only know that some for some i and j, alpha of i is less than or equal to alpha of j, but you get an a priori bound for how long on the x-axis you need to to explore the function in order to for sure obtain such a pair of indices. And that's a better theorem. It, yeah? Better theorem from the point of view of classical mathematics. Yeah? Um, so, some people uh, have built their whole career of um, 
reading classical proofs in optimization, convex analysis, uh, function analysis, stuff like that. Then um, applying several tools, perhaps constructivizing the proof using creativity, perhaps constructivizing the proof using what we discussed in lecture three, perhaps also using other techniques. And, and the, then from that, mining additional piece of information, which is interesting to the original authors of the theory who were not interested in logic or proofs, like proof theory, which just wanted, who just wanted to do mathematics. One of those persons is Ulrich Kohlenbach, yeah, who wrote a book on it. It's called, I forgot, but proof mining is in the title. Ulrich Kohlenbach. I will put a link on the, on the website. Um, I would like to write down one example without proof, and then we do the break. And then we discuss uh, what to do after the break. Just one final example. It's more a teaser for an exercise. Proposition. One, every inhabited detachable set of natural numbers contains a minimum. Every inhabited Detachable set of natural numbers contains a minimum. I will explain what inhabited and detachable is in a second. Second, every inhabited set of natural numbers does not not contain a minimum. And lastly, if every inhabited set of natural numbers contains a minimum, then lamp. Then the law of fluid middle holds. So to give some commentary about that. So we are concerned about sets of natural numbers. For instance, the set of even numbers, the set of odd numbers, the set of prime numbers. And we are concerned with the question whether they contain a minimal element. For instance, the set of prime numbers contains a minimal element, namely two. And that fact can be proven constructively. Or the set of um, odd numbers contains a minimum, namely one. Um, now in undergraduate, yes, yeah. Yeah, something like that. So inhabited uh, means that um, if, if you give a name to the subset X, yeah. Uh, inhabited means there's some element in it that is inhabited, non-empty means the following, do not confuse with non-empty, which means it's not the case, but it's empty, which is equivalent to saying, it's not the case that there is nothing in it. So to this, yeah. Okay, and um, in classical mathematics, you learn every non-empty set of natural numbers has a mean. 
in this form, that theorem doesn't have any chance of being acceptable in constructive mathematics, simply because the precondition that it's non-empty is too weak. If a set is non-empty, we are not even given a single element. And now we are asked to produce a minimal element that is too much to ask. So um, if we would, if we want to have any chance of um, recovering this theorem of classical mathematics in the constructed world, then at the very least, we need to assume that our set X of natural numbers is inhabited, that we have positive evidence that it contains an element, that we actually have an element. But still, in the form like here, every inhabited set of natural numbers contains a minimum. The um, closest translation of that classical well-known theorem to the world of constructive mathematics, still this um, statement um, implies the law of student in the middle. So we don't have it available in constructive mathematics. However, that's not to despair. Um, if uh, we can salvage the C the theorem in two ways, we can either strengthen the assumption or weaken the conclusion. With number two, we did the latter, we weakened the conclusion. We are no longer stating that uh, the given inhabited, inhabited set of natural numbers actually has a minimum. We are just stating that it does not not have a minimum. And you know that the double negation of the statement is weaker than the statement itself. So that's one way of salvaging that theorem. And another is the first one where we strengthen the assumption. Um, now we need that the additional requirement that the subset X is detachable. And what do I mean by detachable? That means for every natural number A, A is in X or A is not in X. In classical mathematics, every subset of the natural numbers whatsoever is detachable because already by the law of absolute middle, we have for any A, that A is an element of X or not. Constructively, this is a much stronger condition. That's a non-trivial condition. Might be satisfied for some Xs, might be not satisfied for some other Xs, at least not provable. Um, and if we have this additional assumption, then we will be able to um, more or less mimic the original proof in order to obtain a minimum. The difference is before, so in this case, two or three, we are just given this inhabited set. So we are given at least one element in it. Okay, good. But we don't have any further way of probing that set. It's like an abstract token. Somebody promises to us that they know a set and they also gave us one element of that set. Okay, but nothing more. To now determine the minimum, we would need to ask questions like, well, um, so you, 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 you said that the number 10 is contained in your set, fine. Now I ask you, is also the number nine contained in your set? We need to ask questions like that in order to narrow down the possibilities for the minimum, right? But for an arbitrary subset, we cannot do that. And for a detachable, we can. Because now the person coming up with that detachable subset needs to answer to questions of that form. For any number, they need to answer whether it's contained in the set or whether it's not contained in the set. And now starting from the given number, we can just check the several, finally many of them other numbers to see whether they're contained in the set or not and thereby uh, get to know the absolute minimum of the set. Okay, we will talk about more of that uh, later. Um, let's stop the lecture right